In this video, we are going to take a look at rules of inference for propositional logic. So before we start talking about the different rules of inference, first let's talk about what our purpose is. Our purpose is to create an argument, or actually a valid argument, where logic will hold. So an argument is just a sequence of propositions. Ooh propositions like P1, P2, etc. such that if P1 and P2 and P3 and all the way up to Pn, whatever that happens to be, implies or if then Q. So we call P1, P2, etc., the premises, and we call Q the conclusion. And if it's a valid argument, a valid argument would mean that the premises imply oops, the conclusion. Essentially, we're saying if this is a tautology, it is a valid argument. So if it is always true, then it is a valid argument. So let's take a look at our statement. If it is raining, I will need an umbrella. Then we say it is raining. And let's talk about how we might write this using propositions. So let's let it is raining be represented by P. Therefore, this is P. And let's let I will need an umbrella be represented by Q. And here we have an if then statement, even though I didn't write the N. So let's talk about how we would write this. My first statement says if P, then Q. My second statement says it is raining, so that's P. So we know in our first statement, if P then Q would mean that if P is true, therefore Q is true. And then I tell you in the second line that P is true. Therefore, what is my conclusion? And again, remember the three dots mean therefore. So therefore, we can say Q is true. I will need an umbrella. Over the next several slides, we're going to take a look at some different uh, rules of inference that we're going to be using. And I'm just going to introduce a lot of them to you and hopefully help them make sense to you so that when we use them, you're just ready to go. So we're just sort of building that toolkit for down the road. The first um, rule of inference is modus ponens. And this should look familiar because we just did an example with the rain and the umbrella on the last slide. So modus ponens says this, if we have if P then Q, and then I tell you P is true, the result is Q. And again, this means therefore. So those three dots mean therefore. Now again, this is exactly what we just did. If it rains, then I'll need my umbrella. It rains, therefore I need my umbrella. Great, so how am I going to write this in another way? Because on each of these, we're going to look at how to write them as a tautology. Um, and basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, if this is true, then that's my conclusion. So how would I write all of that stuff on the top? I would say if P then Q and P. So I'm saying, if this is true, then Q is true. So that's how I would write it as a tautology. Now let's take a look at modus tollens. Very similar. The first statement is the same. The second statement is not Q. And the result or conclusion is not P. So again, here are the premises. And then of course our conclusion. 
And then a lot of people struggle with this one, just kind of making it make sense in their head. But what I would encourage you to do is think about if P then Q and know that I can write if P then Q as an equivalent statement as if not Q then not P. And to me that makes a lot more sense because if not Q then not P looks exactly like modus ponens. We're saying if something then something else, then the first thing is true, then the second thing is the result. And that's exactly what modus tollens tells us. Now how would I write it as a tautology? I would write just as I did before the premises as the if part of the implication. So if P and Q, I'm sorry, if P then Q and not Q, if all of that then not P. Let's take a look at a few more rules of inference. The first is the hypothetical syllogism. And this is, should look pretty familiar to you because this is very similar to the transitive property. The transitive property says if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. And that's exactly what this is saying. It's saying if P implies Q, so if it rains, then I'll need an umbrella. And then if Q implies something else, so if I need an umbrella, then maybe I should wear galoshes. Then the conclusion is if P, then R, or if it rains, then I should wear galoshes. So that's all it's telling us is that one implication essentially leads to another. So how would I write that as a tautology? Again, I'm writing my premises as if P then Q and if Q then R. Then I'm saying if that's true, then the result is if P then R. Hypothetical syllogism. Then we have the disjunctive syllogism, again, because this is a disjunction. And we're saying P or Q and then not P. So we're saying P or Q occurred, but it wasn't P, therefore it was Q. So again, this one makes a heck of a lot of sense to me because if we're saying that P or Q must have occurred, but P didn't occur, it makes sense Q must have occurred. So how would I write that then? I would say P or Q and not P implies Q. The next two rules of inference are kind of silly, actually. Um, but again, we will use these quite often, but the logic is very easy to follow on these. Uh, the first one is addition. And the uh, rule for addition says P. So P is true is what this is saying. That's the premise, is that P is true. The conclusion is that P or Q is true. Well, now this should make sense. We know that when we're dealing with this disjunction, with this or statement, that that tells us that one or the other must be true or both. And therefore, it makes perfect sense that if P, then P or Q which is how I would write that as a corresponding tautology. So if P, then P or Q is true, which makes perfect sense. Simplification is the same thing, but kind of backwards. And notice here, we're dealing with a conjunction, we're dealing with and. So the premise is that P and Q is true. So let's remember that this tells us that both P and Q are true. So the conclusion that tells us that Q is true is sort of a duh. And again, I could have, instead of using Q, I could use P instead, and it's the exact same rule. So again, how would I write that as a tautology? P and Q, so if P and Q, then P. Or if P and Q, then Q. Both of those would be the same. Let's take a look at our last two rules, the conjunction and the resolution. Now the conjunction is super straightforward and kind of silly, um, but really it's just a reminder. Conjunction, which is of course what this is, says the premises are that P is true and Q is true. And because P is Q and true is Q is true, then P and Q is also true, which 
again, we kind of already knew, but that's okay. P and Q. So if those are both true, then P and Q, the conjunction, is true. So pretty straightforward and kind of silly, but it gives us a name to use when we're working with proofs. And then of course the resolution. Now this one's probably the hardest one to get your mind around. Resolution is saying that not P or R is true, and P or Q is true, and if that's the case, then either Q or R is true, or both. So let's think of it this way. Let's pretend not P is true. So if not P is true, then P is false. Now for both of these statements to be true, which is what the premise says, that would mean Q would have to be true, and R could be true or false and we don't really care. But because Q is true, that would make this conclusion true, because Q is true. So let's now take a look at if I changed things up and I said P was true, so not P was false. So if not P is false, that means R would have to be true for this to be true. And then if R is true, we don't really care if Q is true because down here I've got a true. And therefore, no matter what, again, using these premises and the conclusion, we can see that resolution is a valid, um, a valid way of thinking. So how would I write that as a tautology? I would say not P or R, and P or Q. So if that, then Q or R. So let's take a look at why we're learning about these. What are these rules of inference for? And they are so that we can build a valid argument. And a valid argument says that we're going to be given some information, we're going to be given the premise, and it might be more than one premise, and we need to use those laws to show that some conclusion is true based on the premise and based on the laws. So before we look at this one specifically, let's look at just the general. The general case will start with some reason here, and anything that goes here is going to be a true statement. And then anything that goes here is going to be a reason. So it's going to be like a two column proof. And this, typically the first one is a premise, and then from then on, these are going to be your rules of inference that we just learned. And so I'm going to continue with steps and steps and steps until I get to whatever my final step is. And my final step is going to be my conclusion statement. And the reason again will be some rule of inference. And that's how we're going to build a valid argument is we're gonna say, okay, this is true because they told me it was true. And then all of these other things are true because of the rules of inference. And therefore this last thing is true. And that's what I wanted to prove was true. So let's put that into action then. If I were doing this particular question, I would first write P and if P then Q. Because I always started out with a premise. Because how else am I gonna start? I'm gonna start with something that I know is true. So again, P and if P then Q is true because they told me it was true. From there, I'm going to look at my rules of inference and think about the fact that I'm trying to get to the fact that Q is true. Well, based on my premise, I can say that P is true. And how can I say that P is true? We have a rule or a um, rule of inference called simplification. And that simplification rule says that if you have, if P then Q is, I'm sorry, if P and Q, then P. And it also says, if P and Q, then Q. Basically saying, if you've got P and Q are true, then P is true, and P and Q 
are true, then Q is true. So I can say simplification on one. So I'm saying here's my first statement. I'm simplifying that to say P is true. And I'm going to simplify that to say if P then Q is true. So same reason, simplification on one. Now, that seems silly because I didn't really do anything. I just said two separate statements, but that's exactly what this whole process is about. I'm saying, hey, guess what? This is true because I can simplify my first statement. This is true because I can simplify my first statement. My final conclusion is that therefore Q is true. And you might be saying, hold up, you didn't really do anything. How did you show that Q is true? Well, we have a rule called modus Ponens. And if you'll recall, and I'm going to say on two and three before I forget, and if you'll recall, modus ponens tells us that if we have if P then Q and P, therefore Q. And that's exactly what I have here. I have if P then Q and I have P, and therefore Q is true. So this is how a valid argument works. I started with a premise that I knew was true because they told me it was. I used my rules of inference and I got down to my conclusion. So again, here is a premise, here's my conclusion. I've shown that that is a valid conclusion. Let's try another example and this one is going to be harder because we don't know what the propositions are. Um, in the last one it was sort of defined for us and now we have to define them ourselves, which is fine, it's just one extra step. So here's how I would get started. It says we're using the rules of inference to show that the premise is John works hard. Okay, so as I'm reading it, I'm just going to get started for assigning. So I'm going to say that P represents John works hard. Uh, another premise is if John works hard, then he isn't having any fun. So I'm going to let Q represent John is having fun because I can always negate that when I'm writing the actual proposition. And then if John isn't having any fun, then he won't make any friends. So R is going to be John is making friends. So this is something you would definitely want to do before you get started on any sort of logical argument. We need to know what P, Q, and R represent. The other thing I would do before I get started is to write down the premises. Oops, P, R, E, M, I, S, E, S, premises. So the premises are those first three statements. The premises are, one, John works hard. So how could I write that John, I'm not gonna number them or it might get confusing when we do our actual proof. So John works hard is just P. Two, if John works hard, then he isn't having any fun. So isn't having fun. So if John works hard, which is P, if then, that's an implication, then he isn't having any fun. John is having fun is Q, so it's not Q. And then three, if John isn't having any fun, so not Q, John is not having fun, then he won't make any friends, so that would be not R. So these are all premises I can use in my argument, and you'll notice I'm maybe not just going to front load them. So a lot of people like to front load them. And by that, I mean, they're just gonna write all of those things at the beginning. I don't do that because I'm going to write them as I need them. Now, the last thing I'm going to do before I get started is I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the conclusion. John will not make any friends. So my conclusion should be not R. Now it's good to know all of that before I get started because then I know what I what I know, I know what I know, and I know what I'm trying to get to. So let's get started now that we are ready. So we had to do a lot of steps to get ready, but now we're ready, so let's go. Step number one. Again, my first step is really always going to be a premise. So here I'm going to say P because it's a premise. 
I'm also going to say if P then not Q, which is a premise. From here, I'm going to use a law. So notice I've used this guy and I've used this guy. I haven't used the last one yet and that's okay because what I'm doing is I'm saying here's two things that I know to be true and then here's some conclusion. So if I know if P then not Q and P is true, then not Q is true. And that's our good old modus ponens. And again, whenever I'm doing a law like that, a rule of inference, I'm going to give the numbers of the statements that I used. So I used the first and the second statement to say that the third statement was true, not Q. From there, I'm now going to say, hey, guess what? If not Q, then not R. And this was a premise. So now I've used that last premise, but notice I didn't put it at the beginning. I didn't use it until I was ready to, because now what I can say is if I have if not Q, then not R, and I know not Q is true, yep, that's right, I can say not R is true. And the reason I can say not R is true is modus ponens on three, and four. And again, that's exactly where I was trying to get to is that not R was true. All right, I hope you are ready for this one because this one is going to be a bit of a doozy. Here we are going to show that the argument with the premises P, if P and T, then R or S, if Q, then U and T, U implies P, not S, Q. These are all premises. That those will lead to the conclusion that if Q then R is valid. So I know when I start a question like this, it's a little bit overwhelming. What do I know? What do I not know? What, do I, what am I trying to get to? So of course, what I'm trying to get to is my conclusion. Here's where I'm trying to get. And I've got one, two, three, four, five premises. So right away, we know we're going to have quite a few steps in this logical argument. So let's get started together and see how it goes. I'm going to start with one and one. I'm just going to say Q. So Q is true because it's a premise. So what else can I say? Well, I'm going to say if Q, then U and T. Again, a premise. I'm going to move these over a little bit just because I haven't given myself a ton of room. So premise and premise. So that's this premise and this present premise. I've used both. Now, why would I use both of those? Well, because I know that if Q then U and T is true, then and Q is true, therefore U and T is true. So how do I know that? Yeah, that's right. Modus ponens on one and two. So how does that help me? Well, let's think about what I can do next. If I know that U and T are true, then I should be able to say that U is true. And I should be able to say that T is true. And I can do that by simplification on three. Same here. So now what? Well, I'm probably going to take a look at another premise now because I've sort of gotten to the end of what I can say so far. And I have one that says if U then P. So let's do that next. If U then P. And that's a premise. Now why would I need to know that? Well, if I have if U then P and U is true, then my next step is 
should be that P is true. And why is that true? That's modus ponens. on five, I'm sorry, four and six. So P is true. Now think about what I haven't used yet in my premises. I've got P and T. Well, I just showed that P is true. Over here on step five, I showed T was true. So step eight is going to be P and T. Uh, I don't really need the parentheses, but you can have them if you want, either way. So P and T, and how am I able to show that? That's a conjunction of five and seven. So now that I've shown P and T, then I can say this premise, so I'm just going to recopy that premise, if P and T then R or S, and that's a premise, and then for 10, I'm going to say, hey, guess what? R or S is true. How do I know R or S is true? Modus ponens on uh, nine, eight and nine. Oh, my pen stopped working for a second. Eight and nine. All right, so I'm getting close. I'm trying to say if Q, then R. And remember, I started with Q, and my very last step should then be R. So 11 is, again, the last premise that I haven't used, not S, which is a premise. Then 12 would be, remember this one is saying R or S is true, and then it says, guess what? S isn't true. So what does that tell me? That tells me R must be true. And that is the disjunctive syllogism on 10 and 11. Now, it's okay for me to stop right here because I have shown that if Q, based on all of the steps here, then R. If you'll notice, none of the examples that we went through in this video dealt with statements that involved quantifiers. So that's what we're going to look at next is similar to what we just learned, but we're going to deal with quantified statements.